I'm gonna start with a technical question since Colin is a biologist. So <clears throat> follow me along here, this is very technical. Colin, what is a woman? That is the big question of our times. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's weird that they'd have a biologist on to ask me this like basic questions like this. So for, uh, I guess, our society's been running on this idea that being a woman has been an adult human female for quite some time. This is how we've structured our society around it, a lot of our laws. This is why we have sex segregated bathrooms and prisons, uh, uh, et, et cetera, because we acknowledge that we're a sexually dimorphic species. We have males and females, and then our traits sort of vary among individuals, and there's average differences between males and females. What we have now is sort of a newer ideology that's come along that wants to flip all of this on its head and to say, this is not what being a man or a woman is. They want to root it more in just the way that you feel about yourself, your so-called gender identity. Um, and this is why you see things like males like Leah Thomas, who are winning the NCAA Division I Women's Champion in, in swimming and diving. This is why you see males in, uh, in, in female prisons. And a lot of pseudoscience about what biology is that kind of goes hand in hand is why you're seeing this push for so-called gender-affirming care that's rooted in this biological pseudoscience that says that you know, sex isn't really a thing, it's a spectrum, there's more than two of them, maybe it's a social construct. Uh, and if we just give you enough hormones and surgeries, we can sort of you know, make your body align with the way you feel about yourself. Uh, that's kind of where we are now. So this is all tied into the what is a woman question and uh, in, in fascinating and somewhat disturbing ways. <laughs> Sometimes disturbing, yes. Can you explain the difference between sex and gender? These words are tossed about quite often. Yeah. People seem confused about it. So as a biologist, when I first started talking about this, I was only concerned with what biological sex was. I had a bunch of colleagues that were saying the stuff I mentioned, that maybe there's five sexes, maybe it's a spectrum or a social construct. And so my initial thing was to push back just about on the science of things, because I know from studying animal behavior, you need to look at sex differences. It's one of the most fundamental things that leads to differences in the way animals behave. Um, and so I knew that they were wrong when they said there was five sexes or it's a spectrum, because your sex is defined by the type of gamete, sperm or ovum, that you have the function to produce. That's it. This is the definition that's universal among plants and animals, et cetera. Thanks. It's, it's, it's strange getting applause for like, this, <laughs> I know. this is like <laughs> such bio 101 stuff. Um, and so that's what I focused on. I was like, well, this is what sex is. And then it's just like, whatever else, I don't care what people talk about gender. Like, as long as this is what we understand what sex is, gender can be like whatever you want to talk about. And it's become such this miasmic term because it's used as, you know, the psychological identity, how people feel about themselves. You know, feminist discourse talks about gender roles. And the so-called gender binary is the social roles and expectations that people, uh, you know, conform to based on their sex. Um, and yeah, so that's that's kind of what it, it's turned into. But then the activists they 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 talk about sex, they talk about gender, um, and then they mix them both up in sort of a blender. And they'll they'll use they'll, they'll act as though they're synonyms in some contexts and different in other contexts, as long as it sort of pushes their political agenda forward. So I just try to make sure that we're all really clear about what sex is. And then, then we can talk about what gender, as long as we're clear on the terms, I think that's the most important aspect. Okay, so then what is gender dysphoria and how is that different from rapid onset gender dysphoria? The former has been around for a while. Yeah. This latter one, rapid onset gender dysphoria, seems to be a new kind of thing. Yeah, so the former version of gender dysphoria um, it was something that only a very small number of people ever experienced. It was very early onset, so very young in age. You'd have children, mainly boys at the time, that would have a very sort of, it was, it was very genital focused, a hatred of their genitals, this very strong feeling that they were born in the wrong body. You know, that's how they felt. That's how they would sometimes describe their experience. Um, and this intense feeling of discomfort would persist until adolescence until puberty, and it would persist through puberty as well. And many of these individuals, um, once they were adults, felt that they needed to have surgeries and take hormones so they could sort of live the life that they felt that most closely aligned with what they felt like on the inside. Now we have a whole new cohort, the rapid onset gender dysphoria cohort, um, which are mainly children with no history whatsoever of having even gender non-conforming behavior, but certainly no hatred of their genitals or anything. Um, who were just suddenly in adolescence, you know, 12, 13, 14, adopting a transgender identity 
And there's plenty of reasons to, to be weary about this because it doesn't seem to be this organic you know, thing. It's not just that people are being more accepting. It appears to be a product of, of social contagion to a certain degree. We see it more in, in friend groups, in areas that tend to be more politically progressive. Um, and there's reason to believe that these people, because it's you know, a social uh, contagion type of thing, that we can't treat this like the old cohort and just assume that they're going to last through adolescence and adults and give them surgeries and things like that and puberty blockers. So uh, that's the main difference. They're very two different populations that we're dealing with. I've seen some percentages of these um, uh, adolescents in cohorts that were like 40%, half or more, identify as one of the LGBTQ. And I, I just get this sense like anything but hetero, Sis. Like me. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, it's almost like uh, I don't want to be the normal thing. I want to be the. Yeah. Is this just like teens acting out? Yeah. Like in my generation, you, you went goth, but this is something different. I, I, do, I tend to compare it to goth and emo to some degree. Yeah. I, I think one something, something that you're hinting at, um, and that I really stress a lot because we tend to see this clash between two different ideas, and they're often treated as mutually exclusive as. You know, well, what's the reason all these kids are identifying as trans? Is it because there's greater social acceptance? You know, we see uh, Caitlyn Jenner and Jazz Jennings, and there's more people that are trans in the awareness, and oh, people are suddenly just more free to come out at it, uh, as trans. And, you know, this, there's probably some truth to that. Um, but then we have this other side that says it's all social contagion, and there's, there's truth there, too. We have good evidence, as I mentioned, that it tends to cluster in friend circles and in more progressive areas, which is a pattern you wouldn't expect if it was this organic nationwide, you know, social acceptance thing. But something we don't talk about very much is the way that the definition of what it means to be trans has also changed. Um, we used to, it used to be transsexual, and it was kind of what, what I described before, like this very genital-focused hatred of your sex and desire to want to be the opposite sex. Um, if you were to look at what the World Professional Association of Transgender Health what the APA, what the Endocrine Society, what the CDC, how they define what being transgender is, they define it, and it's almost verbatim, but there's slight variations, as an umbrella term for people whose, uh, whose identity, expressions, or behavior differs from what is traditionally associated with their sex. Now think about that. That's extraordinarily broad. Yeah. So a, a girl with short hair, a woman with short hair, well, that's not a form of expression that's traditionally associated with their sex. Same-sex behavior, that's not traditionally associated with their sex. Most, most people are heterosexual. So this expansive definition of what it means to be trans really encompasses every woman in this crowd who's not wearing a gown, you know, any, any man who might have decided that he wants to wear any sort of makeup, any woman with short hair. So being trans is really just synonymous with gender nonconformity. Now, we used to just you know, acknowledge the existence of this, but now this is the new expansive definition. And it wouldn't be a problem you know, if this was just kids expressing themselves and playing with different labels for their identities, it wouldn't be an issue, but it really comes hand in hand with a, a type of medicalization, this idea that there is a mismatch between your body and your brain, and this can be solved through hormones and surgeries and social transitions and all that stuff. So that's the danger because of that medical attachment onto these trans identities. It's not just fun and games anymore. It's really, really, really serious. Yeah, it's like a, a Cartesian dualism when they say, I'm in the wrong body. You are your body. You, you, there isn't like a soul floating or gender soul floating around there and it landed in the wrong body. It yeah. needs to transfer to some other body. Exactly. I mean, the way they talk about, you know, born in the wrong body is you say, we're not born into bodies. Our brains and our bodies develop in concert with each other. Um, you know, we have different features on our bodies that can be varying degrees of masculinized or feminized depending on hormones and things like that. Like, uh, women who tend to be same-sex attracted tend to have a, like a, a, a different digit ratios than mm. that are influenced by prenatal testosterone. So there's there's ways we can you know we can look at people's faces too. People have generally masculine and feminine faces, and we can accurately predict their sex based on just faces. But there's variation, okay? And this is the same thing with our brains as well. You know, people can have brains that have structures that are more feminized and masculinized. But that doesn't determine your sex. That just these are this is just natural variation that Darwin would have expected, you know, if, if, since we're sexually dimorphic, you need variation in order for selection to act on these traits anyway. Um, so a masculine girl or, or woman isn't a man, <laughs> and a feminine boy or a, a, man, a male isn't, isn't a woman. And this is, I think we were making progress on this for a while. This is kind of the general view of things until uh, the gender ideology just kind of 
came in and, and, and reversed all of that progress. Yeah. So we have competing hypotheses to explain the spike in adolescent uh, trans identification, social contagion or social acceptance. So would this be a test if it was just social acceptance of people that are different and we're more tolerant now so you can come out? It shouldn't just be one age cohort. It should be like people in their 20s and 30s and 40s also now suddenly coming out. Is that happening? No, yeah, we, we see it only confined to like, you know, the 25 and under cat uh, category, the same individuals who've sort of been socialized into this new definition of what it means to be trans. Um, because as you say, if, if it's just social acceptance, well, then all these older people who've been presumably in the closet for so long would feel equally uh, free to come out and, and uh, identify as trans as well. But we're also getting two different messages. It's, it's simultaneously the best time in the world to be trans, and then there's simultaneously a trans genocide happening. Mm. And so they, these two kind of ways to talk about this don't really, don't really uh, mesh out because if, if, if it was, it's simultaneously both the best and worst times to be trans uh, in the world. On that early onset uh, gender dysphoria, do we have an accurate percentage? Is it like one-tenth of one percent or one percent, or does, do, do we really know? So traditionally, it had been like 0.05% of the population, I think, had been diagnosed with, you know, the traditional gender dysphoria. Um, but now in some areas, I mean, I did a report in, in Davis, California, where at a minimum it was 6% of kids who were identifying as something other than their sex. Um, and in some areas, it can be even higher than that. And again, this is partly social contagion and expanding definition. Uh, Etc. So yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. spiked like, like like we've never seen before. Yeah, and one of the points that a lot of gay people are making is that those young kids, the early onset gender dysphoria, they're not trans; they're just gay. And if you let them develop out, the the guy's not going to become a woman. The guy's just going to be a gay guy. Andrew Sullivan makes yeah, this yeah. point constantly. Like, what happened to all the lesbians and gays? They're disappearing. <laughs> yes, this goes to what I, I talked to again about that expanding definition. If, if being transgender is this umbrella term that's for your identity, behavior, or expression, it differs from what is traditionally expected of your sex. Well, we know that gender nonconformity is much higher in people who eventually turn out to be, to be gay. Lesbians tend, on average, to be more masculine than straight women. Gay men tend to be, on average, more feminine than straight men. And so, th because they have this gender nonconformity, we have this trans ideology of what it means to be transgender, literally is transing the gay away in many of these, these situations, yeah. where if you just left these kids alone, we know the vast majority would desist in their cross-sex identity by, by puberty. Puberty is often the cure for this type of dysphoria. Uh, and they would, the vast majority would just grow up to be uh, perfectly happy gay adults. But yeah. we know that if we're you know, socially transitioning these kids, uh, often this is seen as like an innocuous, oh, we're just changing their names and pronouns. But we know that about 97% of kids, if you are socially transitioning them at a very young age, they tend not to desist. So you could actually, it's, you know, it's an intense psychosocial intervention, even just changing their names and pronouns. It's, it's, it's sort of a sunk cost fallacy at this point for these kids too, because you know, it's, it's gonna be really hard for them to socially go back the other way when everything has been rolled out for them in terms of you know, this new, this new you. Yeah. Uh, at Freedom Fest, we've long had um, an economist here, you all know, Deidre McCluskey, who's spoken here many times. Deidre used to be Donald McCluskey in the 1990s, then she transitioned, she wrote a whole book about this, uh, and paid a pretty heavy price for it. But she did this in her 40s, right? Lost her family, the kids don't speak to her anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a sad story. So, but, but she did it because something in there just wasn't gelling and at least some people seem to need to do this. And maybe we should distinguish those very few vanishingly rare cases from this social contagion thing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I have a lot of friends who identify as trans and I have nothing, uh, no problem with anyone choosing if they're informed adults to be able to transition and take these surgeries and things like that. Um, my, my girlfriend, Christina Button, she's a journalist. She, she made a really good point. She said that, you know, kids and even adults can't really give informed consent to procedures that they're being misinformed about the nature of their condition. So I do a lot of uh, expert testimony for court cases to define sex and law. And the expert reports on the other side that I get to read are just completely rooted in biological pseudoscience. They say that sex is a spectrum, that it doesn't apply to bodies, it's just aspects of people's bodies. 
Um, so we're lying to kids about the fact that they can change sex. You know, we can't actually change sex, but they're convincing kids that you can literally be the opposite sex if you just take these hormones or have these surgeries. It's important to just tell people the, the truth about the biology of sex. You can't change your sex. Anything you do is going to be cosmetic. Uh, a lot of the literature they cite about, you know, decreased, uh, you know, increased mental health and decreased suicidality. This is not true whatsoever. Yeah, we're using this sort of, you know, would you rather have a, a, a dead son or a live daughter type of thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty grotesque, I think, a lot of the ways that we're, we're pressuring people into doing these procedures. Um, and we just need to be able to give people the actual facts about, you know, the outcomes and what the biology of the sex actually is. So people, when they're adults and can actually make these decisions, they can, they can make them in an informed way, in ways that would actually uh, benefit them in their, their long term. Yeah. If sex and gender uh, are so socially constructed and biology doesn't really matter that much, why do you have to get the surgeries and do the hormones and, and, and change your body? What's the reasoning behind that? So they have this idea that your physical sex can be distinct from your brain sex. So this is what they're increasingly calling your gender identity. They're saying it's your brain sex. Um, and they say that your, your sex is sort of a, a conglomeration of different aspects of your body, like chromosomes and hormones and things like that. And so they would say that if you are have a, if you have the, if your gender identity is female, but your, the, your, your physical sex is male, well, we can tweak your physical sex characteristics, like your hormones and the way your secondary sexual characteristics, in order to bring your body and your brain into alignment. You know, if we were to try to give people therapy to try to make your, your mind more comfortable with your body, this is being construed as uh, conversion therapy, but somehow inverting penises and chopping off body parts isn't conversion therapy whatsoever. So it, this goes to your point that, you know, if you can have a female penis in their mind, why do you need to have, have genital surgery? Um, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I think at some point we need to just acknowledge that their ideology is just sort of this patchwork of of uh, politically motivated reasoning and things that just frankly don't make sense when you really drill into these things. Yeah. All right, last minute. Rights. Um, trans rights are human rights. I don't think trans should be discriminated against or fired just because they're trans or whatever. They should be free to do what they want. We're libertarians, right? Okay, so what's wrong with letting a trans in a, a male to female trans in a women's locker room or bathrooms or prisons? What's wrong with that? Well, there's certainly an area of, of conflicting rights in these situations, because you have, um, if you want to say that trans people have rights, well, what rights do they want? Well, that's, you, trans rights are essentially the rights of people who are biologically male to compete in female sports. Well, females are going to have a very difficult time with this, because that is directly impeding on their rights. You'll often see headlines in newspapers when you have uh, you know, a state that's banning, you know, males from competing in female sports. It'll say, you know, sport bans trans athletes from competing in sports. It's like, well, that's not the case this, at all. Like, no one is saying trans athletes can't compete in sports. It's just that you need to compete in the sport that corresponds to your biological sex. Like, no, no one doesn't want trans people to play sports at all. Um, and this is sort of what it comes down to. It's this conflict between, you know, female rights and what trans people want is the right to impede on the rights of females. So that's where the conflict arises. Perfectly said. Colin Wright, please thank our guest. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Very good, sir. That was great. Really good. Super informative. <laughs> thank you.